Good evening and welcome to the October 16th, 2024 Hudson School Board meeting. Ethan, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any Hudson residents in attendance this evening that would like to provide public input for items on the agenda? Seeing none, we will move to student representative comments. Derek, do you have anything to share tonight? Just trying to like join clubs. That's like that's kind of basically it so far. But we did have some like volleyball games. I'm pretty sure yesterday we had a volleyball game, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna have some couple of more games, and also some uh, some also track meets as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So moving on to new business, the focus, of course, of this evening is the FY 2025 budget. And so, Dan, I will pass it off to you, and we'll begin with the budget discussion. Great. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to starting this process this evening uh, with, with the school board and our administrative team and the public this evening. Um, first, I'd like to thank our principals, our administrative team, for uh, d helping to develop this budget, uh, providing their goals and priorities, the school district goals and priorities. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank uh, Melissa Van Sickle for her support in the budget process. I also know that Ms. Burke is listening tonight and she has also been helping us um, yeah, through the budget process as well. So I, I wanted to give those uh, thank yous and, and support. Um, similar to the last couple of years during my tenure here, uh, there's an executive summary report uh, that is part of the board's packet. Uh, it does outline uh, the different areas from the school board's direction. The superintendent's direction um, has our updated enrollment numbers, budget drivers, warrant articles, default budget, and uh, grant funds. Uh, similarly, our goals are all aligned in this comprehensive budget to our, our priorities and aligned to the strategic plan and the skills and competencies that we uh, are, want to foster and support for our students as they proceed through the grade levels, through the school, school district, and also proceed um, beyond uh, high school for college and career readiness. Uh, everything that we're going to talk about is going to also be aligned to our curricular, uh, curriculum and grade level curriculum priorities as well. So as we talked a lot about um, this fall and going back to the school board retreat, our strategic plan is going through the revision process right now and we are updating uh, the three foundational documents which are the portrait of a graduate for Alpern High School students a portrait of a middle school learner, and a portrait of an elementary learner. Uh, so those are the foundational documents that are part of this, this executive summary to support our budget process and is grounded in our budget work that we've done this fall. Foundational action plans have been identified with areas of improvement. And over the last couple of years, uh, we've also had some external factors that we've spoken about at board meetings. Some of those external factors have been uh, the day-to-day -day operations from a hiring perspective. Some of the impacts we've had for critical shortage areas for hiring, recruiting, and retaining uh, teachers and staff. We've made some great gains in this area, but that continues to be an external factor that we're, we're still working uh, to improve upon. The other areas from a short-term and long-term perspective as part of the FY26 budget and future budget cycles is to look with our administrative team on teacher and staffing needs based upon class sizes, based upon current and future enrollment trends, going back to my first year with the NESDEC enrollment summary, and then also looking at where our enrollment is today and where it's going to be in the near future. We also have some safety and security projects that Mr. Pratt will speak to and Mr. Peterson will speak to, as well as some technology investment projects that will be part of this, project, this budget and some capital improvement uh, projects as well. So the main areas as part of this executive summary were to maintain current class sizes and current staffing levels, focused on curriculum work and uh, curriculum revisions, maintenance and operations proposals and updates, and then also looking to increase support personnel, staff at the elementary level when we talk about interventionists. The next couple of pages that I'm going to mention are some new budgetary items that are part of this budget. Um, and those will be part of the presentation coming up. 
some areas that we looked at maintaining staffing levels, but also looking at staff where we, where we could restructure in certain areas. Um, so for instance, looking at uh, reducing a part-time pet care teacher based upon enrollment numbers and converting that to a part-time computer teacher. And I'll go into a little bit more in depth with the presentation. Some items, um, and similar to the previous years that we've talked about as part of our school board administrative retreats, are items that didn't come forward in the executive summary process, but I felt were important to call back out. Um, and I thought specifically with Mr. Beal's comments that he had mentioned, Dan, we wanna see all budget proposals. So I did also wanna put in this executive summary items that were discussed with the administrative team, but we said this is not the year to have it part of this budget cycle, but again, wanted the opportunity for the board to see those. And then again, if they wanted to make updates as part of this budget process, they could. The last uh, few points I wanna point out is enrollment. Uh, you'll see that uh, our enrollment uh, over the last couple of years is slightly below 3,000 students from 23-24 uh, school year, it was 3,054. We're currently at 2,954. We project enrollment for next year to be 2,921. So again, this provides a nice comprehensive enrollment summary that we've had the last few years. The last couple of points um, that I wanted to mention is in talking with Mr. Campbell last week, I've, I've made a couple of revisions to the executive summary. Um, one in consultation with Mr. Peterson, as I talked about the technology budget, we provided a nice little bar graph to show the increases that is happening in technology. Some of that uh, with the board's support, we've increased uh, computers across the district, but also some other significant um, improvements that we're looking to talk about as part of this uh, budget process, one including an upgrade to our MUNIS system, our financial system, which is uh, over $200,000, which is part of that increase over the last two years, which is a, a one-time budget increase. But that, we wanted to include that graph um, for the technology project. And then in consultation with Mr. Pratt, we also wanted to call out for the board and the public this evening some capital improvement projects. Some of them will be familiar to the board, such as a renovation of two science labs. And some of these capital improvement projects um, are coming forward as items that are part of a preventative maintenance cycle. Uh, Nottingham West, we have to do some repair to the sidewalks. Some of the sidewalks are starting to um, heave and need repair work. Um, also Hudson Memorial School, a fire panel that needs to be replaced. So some big ticket items um, that are also part of the capital improvement project. Most of these are in the operating budget with the exception of the uh, Hudson Memorial School renovation of two science labs, similar to the last two years, uh, called those out in a separate Warren article. Contractual obligations are there for the board's uh, review. Health insurance also is here. Um, it's budgeted at 10% for health insurance and dental uh, is an expected increase of 5%. These are actual increases. Um, the, excuse me, the actual rate increases typically are announced by school care or insurance provider in the mid-November timeframe. So we've put in estimates of 10% for health insurance and 5% for dental. We do have the uh, retirement numbers and the retirement rates for employees. Those have decreased um, from 13.53%. Uh, they've decreased to 12.75%. And the teacher category has decreased from 19.64% to 19.23%. Those are actual numbers that are reflected in the budget. The last pieces are similar for the board's review, staff and teacher turnover for the last uh, four years, we've updated that chart uh, to include where we are right now. And I'm pleased to say that while we've had 21% uh, teacher turnover in 22-23 and 22% in 21-22, uh, I'm pleased to report that our teacher turnover for the 23-24 school year was 13%. Better, still some work to do, but uh, much improved. And staff turnover is also slightly down at 10%. Still work to be done there. Conversely though, you can see our staff alternative certification um, has increased with the number of staff that are on alternative certification pathways. I'm not gonna do more of a page turn on this for right now. I'm going to actually skip to the presentation to just call out some things there, but I'm gonna pause to see if there's any questions from the board before I go into the, the presentation.
Not a question, and I probably should have led with this. For anyone that may be watching at home, I do just want to mention that all of the documents that we are going to be reviewing both this evening and then for the next few evenings related to the budget are all available on the Hudson School District website. If you go to Departments and Business Office, right on the left-hand side, you will see the district budget, and you can select any and all of the documents, again, those that are being reviewed tonight, and then also the upcoming presentations over the next couple of weeks. So I do just want to call that out. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. Thank you. Um, so similar to the last couple of years, the budget overview page. So this, uh, this page here in the, in the pr uh, presentation goes through each of the uh, key function account areas of the budget, and you can see the percentage change. As mentioned, um, the one area that you'll notice is significantly up is technology. Mr. Peterson can speak to that. One of those big ticket items is, again, looking at a new financial software system of uh, approximately $200,000 for an upgrade to an antiquated financial system that has been needed to be updated for some time. Facilities is slightly down. The other function areas are either cost neutral or slightly increase or decrease. The overall budget uh, percentage change uh, is 1.6%. Uh, you can see the revised budget from FY25 is $69,710,543. The proposed budget as of today for FY26 is $70,825,419. Again, an overall percentage increase of 1.6%. We've also included general funds and we've also included other funds that are part of what compile and make up the overall budget. And then under the budget note, um, this page here talks about what the default would be for FY26. So without proposed items, the default budget for FY26 is $69,041,735. And those areas that are part of the default are contractual obligations. So year two of uh, the contract for PSRPs and the cost differential there. AFSME contract, negotiate, uh, contract uh, obligations for year two of the administrative agreement are there in the Teamsters year three of the agreement contractual obligations. An increase uh, to offset revenue from grants, food service, and revolving funds. And then a slight decrease in other contractual obligations are also noted here. Um, so that's what goes into making up the default budget um, being slightly higher of $626,192 from the FY25 budget. I'm gonna pause there for a moment to see if there's questions before I go into enrollment. Enrollment numbers, um, just, just to give a quick pause. I think so. Okay. Um, so as mentioned in the executive summary, this, uh, this enrollment chart uh, dates back to the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, it also notes in 2020-2021, the first year of kindergarten. Um, is also noted so you can see where our enrollment is today and um, where we project enrollment to be for the next school year. This is the page that I really wanted to spend some time and talk about. It's in the executive summary, but I wanted to call it out here in the presentation. So some of the staffing plans in, in consultation with the building level administrators was looking at class sizes at the elementary school and really targeting those class sizes to be ar around 16 to 19 students per class for kindergarten and first grade. And then to have class sizes be maintained at 21 to 24 uh, uh, for grades uh, fourth and fifth grade. Class sizes at the middle school are targeted between 16 and 25, again, depending on the variance of what classes are being offered and for safety requirements. And similarly, class sizes at the high school, there is a discrepancy between, uh, or di there's a differential between 10 and 25. Again, if you're looking at an AP class, that might be 10 or 12 students for an AP science class, that might be 10 or 12 students versus um, a class that um, for instance, a humanities class that might be 24 or 25 students. The updated positions that are part of the FY26 budget that were reviewed by administrators and will be talked more as part of the budget process. Um, in consultation with Ms. Borge, uh, one new BCBA position district-wide. In consultation with Ms. Labrie and uh, Ms. Blackwell, six uh, classroom part-time cl classroom assistants for grade one. We found, we found really good success to start the school year with the kindergarten classroom assistants. Um, so proposing that in the proposed budget. 
Uh, looking at converting a paraeducator, library paraeducator position to a full-time certified library media specialist. Um, and then similarly, that doesn't mean that th this person that's currently in this role will not have an opportunity to stay with the district. This person would. It's just looking to restructure um, where we have um, a need to have a full-time library media specialist. So when folks see some of these changes, it doesn't mean the person that's currently in this position will, will still have an opportunity to work in Hudson. So I did want to call that out. Um, a new part-time math interventionist and a new part-time ELA interventionist in talking with Mr. Baker, and he'll talk about this a little bit more, thinking about the last couple of years, talking with the board of what those other needs are, those key needs for the district from an academic improvement lens. Mr. Baker and Ms. Tufts thought very strongly and recommended, and Ms. Benson and I support additional math and ELA interventionists for both Nottingham West and Hills Garrison School. In talking with Principal Bowen, we do want to provide some additional unified arts opportunities for our middle school students. And we do have a lot of variance in unified arts class sizes. So you can have a physical education class that could have 30, 31 students, and then you could have a class that may have 20 students. Unified arts class can help offer. to uh, repurchase, to do a little bit of a refresh, but it's really the part-time and looking to make that part-time computer science teacher full-time with the offset of the part-time pet care teacher um, that was not needed for this school year based upon uh, student enrollment and, and student requests. Items that were not part of the budget but I think is important to call out is um, as part of our review convert a current part-time career center coordinator to full-time. Um, this could be offset with the Perkins grant, the salary portion, but the benefits would need to be in the operating budget. Um, I did not feel that this was the fiscal year to do that. I know this proposal has come forward in previous budget cycles, but this was one that in this budget cycle uh, I didn't think was a good opportunity to move forward with. And the other that I, we talked about with Ms. Blackwell and uh, Ms. Labrie was also a part-time math and ELA interventionist between two schools. And my hesitation with that was looking at the EC, ELC committee that started and knowing that we're going to have some restructuring. I, I want to pause before we start adding that level of staff um, to, to the district. And I also want to see how our goals and priorities are progressing before making that, that change. So those are some ones that didn't move forward in the current budget. Um, the next slide really talks about salaries and benefits overview. I've already highlighted the health insurance pieces where we have estimates. Um, life insurance and long-term disability, uh, we have not received those rates um, as of yet. Um, so those are at 0%. Uh, the retirement pieces I've already called out. And then we will proceed um, to the actual uh, school budgets. Um, I'm going to pause there again to see if there's questions from the board um, before we get into the school and department budgets. I do have one question, Dan, and we can talk about it more perhaps next week with the Hudson Memorial presentation. The new culinary arts teacher, while the infrastructure is there from family and consumer science, is there an additional cost related to consumables for adding a culinary class at Hudson Memorial? There will, um, great question, there will be some consumable costs. Okay. Um, is that reflected in the Hudson Memorial budget? I would want to check that okay. with Mr. Uh, Principal Bowen just to make sure. Um, okay. um, I'm not, I want to just confirm that. Okay, if yeah. we can next week, okay. Can Thank I also you. follow up on sure. that about the state of the equipment? When was the, when was the program? I'm sorry, I don't know no, the it's history. No, that's, of a good, that's a great question. Does so uh, have to be updated? Is that in the budget or is discussion? Can we, can we do these next week? Okay, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we just have a late night. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, but yeah, I'll, yeah, I'm writing that down. Okay. Hopefully Keith can give us a full yep. background because even myself, Mike, I don't, I don't know if I know off the top of my head either. Okay. It was okay. there when I was there. So like two years ago, it was good. 
Principal Bowen did include, the, thank you, um, Melissa, the food and supply costs for the culinary right. program are included in his budget. Okay. But the equipment, we should follow up on that question. Other questions relative to the budget overview before we get specific into the school and department budgets? I'm for the Thunderdome, yeah. let's go. Yep. <laughs> okay, so we do have our elementary principals here, uh, Mr. Baker, Ms. Tufts, Ms. Blackwell. Um, so I will have them uh, go next. I think Mr. Baker, uh, you were g gonna lead us off here. Good evening, everybody. So we have the elementary principals here. We're gonna present the uh, combined elementary budget. So we'll start off um, principal's commentary. So our overall elementary budget is up 3.1, which is 403,708. Salaries and benefits are, um, are 370,739 of that. So that means 32,696 is what's left of of the increases for all of the elementary budgets so um, and as you can go through um, we talk about the math program the ELA some of the things we're doing um, with being a writer magnetic reading um, so the commentary basically talks about just some of, the, some of the stuff that we have in the budget and then if I can take you to the budget walk which is page seven that's kind of where we get to the major increases decreases that we'll talk about so if you look at the proposed budget walk, we're under, uh, at the very top, we're talking about, um, well, we can go to re uh, reading the uh, textbook replacement. So do you see all of those major increases? You have a $10,000 increase at HO, $10,000 increase at Nottingham West, and $8,000 increase at Hills Garrison. So at HO Smith, we did some uh, moving around. So at HO, we added being a writer, which is the new the new writing program that we have, and then they moved several items from the reading supply their reading supply line items to textbook replacement. And we all did that. We looked at the reading supplies, and we looked, and there are several things in our reading supplies that really should actually be in textbook replacement. So when you look at Nottingham and Hills, we also added being a writer, but we moved our magnetic reading materials and we moved our foundations materials from reading supplies to textbook replacement. That's why you're gonna see those major increases. And you're also gonna see those decreases in our reading supplies. So you're gonna see, you're gonna see that those, kind of, uh, those kind of moves. Um, when you get down to software, you're going to see um, a couple major increases and a couple uh, major decreases. So for, um, and these both are Hills, um, Hills and Nottingham. So our software accounts um, went down 14,000, 15,000, and Hills went down 12,000. Um, that's due to we took out Acadian's math, the student license for, licenses for that, and we also eliminated math and focus, the student and teacher licenses for that. Um, and by, by uh, in, in my budget, that taking math and focus out, that was down 14,820, which is basically the entire decrease. So when you look at those two decreases, that's kind of where that came from. Both Hills and Nottingham took those out. The major decrease or increases, 21,000 and 18,000, those are our new math program. That's for the new math program that we're piloting this year. Um, I already reveal. Um, K through one, we're doing iReady and Eureka Squared. Um, so whichever program is chosen this year, we have the money budgeted for next year. So that's actually the math software account. The reason it went up so much is we didn't have anything in math software before. So that's the, literally the entire increase. Okay. Question quick. Yep. Is, is that the price for only one program? That is the price for one program. Okay. Yeah. And I believe we always budget for the most expensive one. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, Which one's the more expensive one? I believe it's iReady. Yeah, of course. It's Reveal. <laughs> it's Reveal. Oh, it's Reveal. We just, uh -huh. I thought it might be iReady, too. Just a to follow-up on that. Yeah. But it's a pilot this year. It is. So if, we, if the pilot is successful and we roll it out broader, do we have any idea of how expensive that would be? Um, it would be, it's factored in here. It's so the cost per grade level. Yeah, th this is the cost for the, for 
for the program, for a program. So if we go with it next year, it would be the same price plus inflation yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Um, and then down in um, furniture replacement, um, Hills and Nottingham, um, you're going to see the same price, 7888 um, that's for um, new library shelving. Um, we both are in need of um, some library shelving. Um, I replaced most of li my library shelving already. These are the last couple bigger pieces that I need to be replaced. And Theo also needs some um, shelving that needs to be moved around. Just and start, yeah. yeah, start to replace some bookshelves. Yeah. Did we cut that fully last year, Theo? You did. Okay. Yeah. And that's it for the major increases and decreases. Everything else, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of movement. I mean, the entire budget's only up thirty-two thousand with dollar salaries, salaries and benefits. So, um, if you have any other questions, you want me to go through anything else? I'd be happy to. I just have sort of a generic series of questions. So, overall, with this budget, salaries and benefits are up. There's a couple of things here. One, do you feel that this aligns with helping us with our academic achievement. Um, then sort of a follow-up would be what additional would you need to help with, not just test scores, but the whole academics at those early levels and setting, folk, setting the kids up for, for success all throughout. Yeah, I think this budget does reflect what we're trying to do. I mean, we just talked about data on Monday. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, magnetic, you, being a writer. We talked about a new math program. All of that's in the budget. I'm thrilled about um, the interventionists that we're going to, you know, be working on. So I'm, I'm glad we're, we're moving to that. Um, so, no, this budget does reflect what we need. Um, all the principals meet. We actually meet with the superintendent and assistant superintendent, and we discuss. And um, Dan's great about talking about kind of what we need. And, and he is like, what else do you need? What do you need? And, you know, we do try to be mindful of the budget. We don't want it to go super high, but we're also looking at if we want to add something, can we take something away? Can we reduce something? So we, we really are mindful of, you know, the increases. We're also mindful that we need a budget. We need to have the money to do what we need to do. Um, the only thing I would say that, are you asking what I want, a wish list? Yeah. I All mean, right. If, if so, the, so I was I was doing a lot of things because I knew this question was coming up, and we actually <laughs> talked about it. And I was going to say interventionist, but Dan, you were rocking that out. Um, I would say the the one thing, one piece I I truly believe personally that we're missing is a is computer teachers at the elementary school. Um, technology is the way of the future, and we don't have technology. We don't have computer teachers at the elementary school. And I really think that that is a missing hole in what we're trying to do um, because every teacher has a different expertise when it comes to technology, and those are the computer teachers that are teaching the kids all day. Um, I think our teachers do a wonderful job because now we have one-to-one -one laptops. Thank you to the board for that. That helps out tremendously. So our, teach our teachers are using technology like it should be as holistic part of a lesson. Um, so they're doing a great job with it. But I also think that we need to have a curriculum. And in second grade, they need to know this. In third grade, they need to know this. In fourth grade, they need to know this. And we need a really a computer teacher to really take people, take our students through those steps to when we're done with fifth grade, everybody has a portfolio. Everybody knows all the skills, all the required skills, all moving through fifth grade. And I just think that's a heavy lift to ask a teacher to do that when they have everything else going on. And we do have the open slot in our specialist schedule because computer lab is really in the classroom with the classroom teacher when we could easily have a, a computer teacher teaching those classes. Um, so in my opinion, that's the big hole that we're missing and that's what I would like to see. Agreement? I have something like slightly smaller. I, f I would love um, for us to create, and this would be like conversations with Dan and Jessica, but like lead teachers at the elementary school level, like a stipend, so that there could be a lead teacher at each grade level who could kind of lead the team. I think um, at the high school and the middle school, you know, there's department heads, but maybe at the grade level there could be more like leadership um, internally. So I would look, for, I would, I would, lo I would love that, like a stipend to do that lead teachers in each grade level. There are some very natural leaders anyway at my school, but also, you know, reinforcing that. Perfect. 
Amy. God, do you know of other elementary, sorry, Amy. Do you know of other elementary schools that have that computer teacher? Well, when I, when I taught in Colorado, every elementary had a computer teacher. And that was, thir that was a, lot, a long time ago. Don't take yourself. <laughs> I can speak to what, what was done in a nearby district where I came from, where um, it wasn't a certified educator who filled the role, but it was, it, the schedule was similar to it being one of the unified arts classes, like the way we already have it set up here. But instead of it being led by the classroom teacher, it was led by um, a, a, they described it as a TA. Really, it was someone who was, um, ha had more of a background in education than the requirements for a paraprofessional but they didn't need to be certified as an educator. What the, the people that tended to be attracted to the position were people who left um, you know, the private sector and technology and were excellent educators as far as um, teaching children the, the basics of. Yeah, like we have a couple teachers that could easily go into that job and be an comp awesome computer teacher because those are probably the best computer teachers or teachers that have been in the classroom that know the kids and have that background and also are very proficient with technology. So, yeah. Even retired people maybe from the industry who are trainers in technology who want to just take on like a, a role like that. I have a sub who's like that actually. She came from corporate. She's a retired and she's subbing, but she was a, a she software trainer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Be interesting. That was my experience as well. Yeah. Anything different at the ELC, or would these both be beneficial um, for you too? I, I I concur with Scott's wish on a wish list as far as that goes. I find it's important. Um, what I found historically, having most of my experience as a K to five educator, is the the challenges when they get to third grade and they're expected to take the New Hampshire State Assessment. And part of the training that the teachers have to do to get them there is the navigation of the computer. Not to mention, you know, what we're all starting with it, content related. Um, so it's like a, it's it's two components to get these kids prepared, and some of it really is about navigating the computer, the mouse, the, the toggling um, that's required in that state assessment. So it's, I wouldn't even necessarily just suggest this for the two through five buildings. I would suggest it for all of us. What I appreciate from Dr. Moulis is uh, the request that's already in the budget for the cl six classroom ass um, assistants at the first grade level, because I believe at, at Library Street, the teachers are very pleased with what they've been given this year by having a shared classroom assistant between two classrooms it seems to be working out very well in our build in my building down there and I know that's already been and, and I understand um, again where we're headed as far as that part-time interventionist request both for um, ELA and math not knowing where we're headed in the bigger picture to hold off on that I'm okay with that for now depending on where that lands maybe it would be a different conversation next year. On that one, can someone explain to me how, how would, even if we potentially, without getting into a restructuring debate, mm. how does that change our need? Well, the, the need is student-based, right? And yep. the, the number of students don't really change. Right. When we looked at, with our current interventionists there, and again, student population being roughly 200 in each building, um, I wanted to give a little bit more time also with some of the curricular priorities and some of the changes. Okay. So the, there was that piece, and then as Ms. Blackwell mentioned too, not knowing what the restructuring would be, uh, I just wasn't quite ready to say this is the year to do that, but also knowing that curriculum priorities that we have right now and instructional priorities, I wanted to give that a little bit more time before adding additional personnel to the budget at the ELC. I have a two-part question, um, either Scott or Theo. The part-time math and ELA interventionist, can you speak a little bit to what person in that role does, what an interventionist um, does, how that helps meet some of the goals that we've talked about, as you alluded to, Scott? And then something that we've somewhat related, we talk a little bit about, we know that we have students that are below grade level, and 
we know that we have students that are above grade level. And years ago, there was a program at Nottingham. I, I don't know if there was one, something similar <coughs> at Hills. Could this person also meet some of the needs of some of our students that are also above grade level? So could you speak to where you see the interventionists fitting in, in your schools? So I'll say right now, our interventionists see, we doesn't see the enrichment kids. Um, we have a, a, a need for intervention in math. We have a lot of kids that are low in math. Um, so based on screening, um, we look at you know qualifications for Title I. Uh, once Title I gets picked, then we usually have our math interventionists really work with some of, some of our neediest kids um, that are struggling with, with their math skills, um, trying to fill some of those gaps. Um, but right now, that's kind of what they're doing, is they're working with some of our, our neediest population. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, I think that, you know, you know, what are we doing for that enrichment group? Um, you know, we did have a program. You're right, we did have a program five, maybe five years ago, but that was a retired math teacher from the middle school that came in and would do enrichment classes for our fifth grade, um, which was great. I mean, it, it was great, but it's like everything else, you know, when that person is gone, then that kind of program is gone too. And so when she left, that never got reestablished. Um, so, but having some type of enrichment program, that's, I mean, that's something else. I mean, in Nashua, we had an, kind of an enrichment program that they would do. Um, we don't really have that. I mean, it would be nice if we did have, the problem is we have so many kids that need intervention that it's hard to look at the other side when we have all this need. Um, so, but it would be a great idea to have the, have, have, that person start to work with some of the enrichment kids. And we usually have that, have the teachers really work on that because they have to do the differentiating in the classroom, um, which that's what is the art of teaching, right? That's what makes teaching such a hard, hard job. A lot of our teachers, I think, internally do that in their classrooms, you know, yeah. know the students that need more. Um, so that, that does happen a lot. Yeah. And I know our reading specialist last year, like I think one period a day, did try to take some higher level readers and work with them and challenge them a little bit. And at Hills, there was enrichment. There was extracurricular, they called it, after school, where they did like a book club. So I have some teachers who, who have stepped up and done that at Hills this year and last year. We do a run club, we, do a, we did a gaming club, you know, like board games. Like kids don't know how to play board games anymore. Um, so, I, you know, I'd love to fill that need as well. Yeah, and, and for, for ELA, we had, we lost the fifth grade teacher, so our UA, our UA teachers had an extra block. Um, so I actually asked them to do some enrichment with some of our kids. So our art teachers do an enrichment art, act, art, art class each week. Um, our librarian is doing a book club for fifth grade right now. Um, our, library, our music teacher is doing enrichment to where anybody wants to learn some different instruments. Um, so, I mean, we, tr I mean, we really try to utilize our staff to the best of our ability. Um, so we are trying to work with. But we could tease out the interventionists and maybe find a period a day or you know, a block of time a day to take you know, a group from each grade level. It, but right it, now, it's, it's our yeah. neediest kids we it's need just, to address almost, right now. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I was talking to my reading specialist today, and it's like she has six groups back to back to back, barely gets a lunch, and you know what I mean? So it's, it's go, go, go. But it's go. a population I don't, we don't want to um, ignore, yeah. right? Ethan. Amy, how does our budget process compare to that experience in Nashville? It's more challenging for me, um, perhaps because it's brand new and I'm, you know, only a couple months in. Um, and in Nashua, I was an assistant principal, so I was really following the leadership of my principal. Um, but I'm learning a lot, and I will tell you, my principal colleagues have been outstanding for any question I've had. Um, I w I'm also in a unique situation where a good portion of the budget is shared as the ELC. And Mary Ellen has taken the lead on that and taught me things and explained things to me. And, you know, having worked with both Scott and Theo as colleagues in the past, everyone is a, a quick question or a phone call away. How do you feel about your budget 
and understanding a large portion of that is shared. You feel like you have what you need? Mm -hmm. I do, and it's been, it's been seamless to collaborate with Mary Ellen and, and learn the parts that are shared and how they get divvied out. Um, so it, it's been fine. Gary. Just going back to the enrichment piece for a minute. So obviously you don't have data in front of you, but did we ever measure reading it at Hill, did we see an, you know, part of me, as I understand that there's that group that has the obvious point, if you things others with them, right, because it's like, I want to get to that, you know, that, actually impact and help us academically lower but and so we're not taking a like if we had a part-time person so when we were so we basically um, use I ready to determine to turn we use meaning to determine who would qualify to be in her group and you know, and I ready when you do when you test really high, like 99th percentile and so forth. It's really hard to grow on that top scale. But what we did see with those enrichment kids is they did grow on that top scale, which was is fairly hard to do. Um, and that's what we are, we're asking our teachers to do now. So we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of that growth because you know that's kind of what we were looking at when we were doing data catches is, is like we're looking at you know the low kids are they are they moving up? Are our meeting kids moving up? But our high kids when they're at the 99th percentile, the test gets can, can, gets harder. But are they also growing? Um, as well as everybody else and at one point we were thinking no they weren't they were kind of staying stagnant they're still high they're still higher than everybody else but are they actually growing to where they needed to grow and I think we started to move in that direction and I think teachers really took account for that and are really trying to provide that enrichment in the classrooms but we did see that growth when we had that um, when we had that um, enrichment program great thanks Ethan 370 for new salaries, that's those 10 part-time people total, correct? So the, the six classroom support plus the four part-time interventionists, that's 100% is that 370? That's in here. I'm just, I, 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 I think so, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding correctly. I don't know. Right, that, that 370, 739, the 3.04 salaries and benefits are up. That's purely from those 10 additional staff people. The increase in salaries and benefits? Yeah. Oh, I, that's probably all contractual as well, right, Dan? Yeah, I, I think it's also contractual. People change their benefits. health plans and, and all that. There's a ton that goes What do we think? That. We may not have an answer tonight. I'm curious what the, what the additional is what the addition is for those 10 total part-time. If, if I may, yeah. it does include all the new positions okay. that they had requested and Dan had approved, mm -hmm. as well as any changes in staffing, health rates, et cetera. So do, do you, any, even a ballpark I'm, I'm comfortable with on those 10 new, do you have that? I, I have some of that. Sure. Um, and I'm doing this on the, on the cuff here. Um, so the six additional part-time first grade is classroom assistance. Yep. That total amount um, is 115207 Okay. Then the, we have four of them, part-time, two part-time math interventionists yep. and two part-time reading interventionists. Yep. So it's going to be $38,941 times four. Okay. Um, so those are the, the new positions at the elementary level. Okay. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Ethan. The software subscriptions out of those eight are some of those more Theo and Scott for you guys, and then others are more for the ELC. Do you think they're all, all eight of those are used by both levels? Just curious. So type to learn probably is just for the upper Okay. You guys don't 
Spark is in as a PE subscription, so that's probably just for us as well. Okay. Generation Genius. Do you guys use Generation Genius? Oh, it does go down. It's a lower. It's it goes down to like kindergarten. It's a it's a lower science science uh, software. Class Creator. We all use. That's how we 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 help with that. Brain Pop. We use Brain Pop. They use Brain Pop Junior. Junior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, I think just two through five users reflex math, um, in factivation, generation genius, we all use, and mystery science, we all use, don't you use mystery science? Yeah, so we all use mystery science. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm gonna circle back just to the generation genius. Does yeah. anyone use that? Yeah, I have teachers using that. Oh, okay. Yeah. We actually use it K-8. Okay. okay. Yeah. Is that cost split according? It's per, it's budgeted per building. Next cut. You know it's coming, I hope. <laughs> I hope they told you, Amy. If not, you can be mad at them. Don't be mad at me. All right, I ask it every year. I'm the nice guy. I ask so what can we cut out of the budget? Please tell me where are the cuts coming from. All right, from. Theo, you go first. I don't really want to cut my library bookshelves anymore. Okay. We discussed it. Tell us about Theo. Okay, I could. So my cafeteria table, I have a replacement cafeteria table, $1,200. I mean, the brakes don't work on the table, but like I, I can wait until it really like brakes. <laughs> brakes, yeah. So Where are they, why are we accelerating so fast? We need brakes. I don't know. So I would, I would give up a cafeteria table. Is there furniture. just one in your budget? Just one in your budget? There's, I think two. there's two. Yeah. So I would probably get rid of the, um, the additional one. And I'd probably get rid of the library shelving if I needed to. Um, pretty much equipment and furniture, that's kind of what I would try to get rid of before anything else. Any other discussion related to the elementary school budget? Amy? I, if I were asked to cut something, the first place I would be looking would be in furniture. I can't be specific, and I'm n not going to speak for the furniture that it, part that's shared, with, like with a, where it's it's separated out for H. O. Smith. Um, but when you think of all the other things that go into the budget that serve the students more importantly, that's where I would try to make my cuts. Class size, Dan. Can you remind me what did we say? Sixteen to nineteen. Right here. Um, yeah, I, yeah. 16 I have to between, <coughs> between 17 to 22. Yep. In your building? Yeah, for next year projections. Yeah. Yep. Scott and Amy, any ideas where you are in your buildings? Yeah, same thing. Second grade, second grade's a little, second grade's a little lower. Our biggest, our big grade is is going to be um, looks like fourth grade. Um, that'll be the highest grade. That's like 24, 23, 22, 23. Sixteen at the at Library Street School. Is your largest class? Almost every class is sixteen. Is exactly sixteen. How many total classes? Is sixteen there? times twelve. couple of specific line item questions and I'm not sure I apologize which school page 29 of the budget um, increase for it looks like replacement of a projector Just wondering that's is that that's me yeah okay. that's the P. Yeah. yeah so my PE teacher has been asking for this um, projector it's a sh called a short throw projector um, and what it does is it kind of clears away the um, gymnasium floor because right now she has a projector with wires that are on a cart. And um, they're kind of, a, it's a tripping hazard. And I had a feeling you might ask about that. Mm -hmm. So I have some kind of justification for an ultra short throw projector in PE. Um, so I can give you this, but basically, you know, safety is the number one reason she doesn't wanna. Okay. Um, I, I haven't kind of dug into um, 
she she got a quote from me in preparation for this building for this meeting. Oh, I have another copy too, Dan. Thank you very much. Oh, I made enough copies for everybody. <coughs> Thank you. But she really does use it, use her projector a lot to display like her agenda, what the activity is. She'll run a YouTube video sometimes as a concrete example for students. Um, engagement. Um, she she um, also, um, with the ability to project real time feedback, performance reviews, or motion analysis on large screens, students can see instant replays or breakdowns of their movements. So like she tries to teach them how to throw. So they, 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 she doesn't videotape them, but she'll get an elementary school student up there and kind of show them the dynamics. So it, it, is, a, it is a pricier item. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I appreciate you bringing yeah, this deal. But Thank there's you. the justification too, so for the team. What was the, what was the cost? Uh, uh, two, together. Uh, together 3,188. Bottom, bottom of 29. Um, on the top of page 31, there's some equipment replacement, an increase of just under $2,000 listening centers plus the shipping and handling. What are those top of page 31? Those are for HO. They do those, um, they have little listening centers that you put and you have like the, the headphones, the several headphones that go in it. So when teachers do like uh, small groups mm -hmm. and they do um, center work, a lot of times they'll have a book um, that's played on tape, but they'll have more kids at the center, more than one student, so they need those centers to have the different headphones so kids can listen to the same book on the same system. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Um, just the, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but the increase from last year's budget, is it that we're just looking to add more of those at HO? Is it a replacement? And an additional cost there, just going from 2,105 to 4,016. Just wondering. I think they the added is. more okay. listening centers. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any other questions related to the elementary school budget? We appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, you guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Tonight. So next we have uh, Mr. Pratt and the school uh, facilities portion of the budget. One quick request for next year's budget. When we add positions, I know we do them in the overview. Can we make sure that we're adding them in the commentary at that level where they apply so okay. I can track that better a little bit? Yeah. Again, a little bit lazy by me, yes, but that would help me significantly. And may, I, may I add to that request? Sure. In the overview, I, I believe in years past, can we include what the cost is for any new positions? Cost to new positions. Please. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for coming, John. No, no problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with the department and commentary. We have the same amount of uh, positions and facilities as we did last year. Uh, this year we did repurpose our general maintenance uh, worker and made that into a HVAC technician position. I know we discussed it last year in the wish list, what would you have? Uh, so we made that work within our uh, current structure uh, without changing any job descriptions. So we didn't want to add a position, but we we're trying to utilize our positions the best we could. And we took our groundskeeper uh, level two and, and made that job description more maintenance related and grounds related. So if the grounds department needed an extra set of hands at a certain time of year, he could help out. 
but that keeps us in line with the general maintenance, so we still have someone on staff to do that. So that's kind of a small change there. John, are you fully staffed right now? We are. Uh, we have one position, part-time position that we're uh, advertised for. H.O. Smith, the gentleman is retiring at the end of this month. That's the only open one, but we're currently interviewing for that. Uh, you'll see when we get to our staffing, uh, I get a few positions in there I'll need to, to, to address um, that, are, that are over budgeted, so we'll go over that in a second. So can I just make sure I understand that? So the, the vacant HVAC position is filled. Is filled? No. Right. At the time when this was is running, we were okay. interviewing for it, so it's just it's it's, it's and that and, and that was essentially budget neutral because you made the adjustments to the others. Right. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. Um, so it's showing that our, my proposed budget this year is down by 4.52%. But as usual, that takes out all the Warren articles that were added. So it's a little bit deceiving uh, to say it's actually down that much. Um, if I actually take where my budget is and add those back in, uh, did some quick numbers on that. It would actually look like we're up roughly one and a half percent. But when we get into the staffing positions and the ones we're actually going to have to remove, it actually, uh, it's only, we're only, we're actually down by 31,000 roughly. Uh, so it's, it's down by maybe point half percent, you know. Uh, that came up at the budget committee level last year and it was a little bit confusing for them to understand with the Warren articles coming out and then, you know, it's, it, it is a little bit deceiving. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. Uh, so we're just slightly down, almost level funded from last year at, at the end of the day. Um, we are adding uh, to this budget uh, some of the bigger items that we're looking to do is insert uh, more blue alert beacons throughout the district at all our buildings as discussed in our emergency management committee. One of the things that came up was in the louder environments, cafeterias, gymnasiums, band room. Uh, when the blue beacon alert goes off, they're only outside. Um, when, the, when we do pull the panic button, uh, obviously they have announcements. And if you're in those large areas with cafeterias going, uh, a lot of times you're not, you can't actually hear it, in the gymnasium. So we thought as a committee, if we added the blue beacons in there and that was pulled, the, the staff would know that there's, there's something going on or, or it's an Alice drill or whatever, what have you. So that's one of the, one of the bigger things. Um, and we would also, with, with those upgrades, add more security to uh, Alvern High School. Currently, um, the CTE doesn't have any blue, exterior blue beacons and we're gonna, we want to add some more partitioning inside the building to secure certain areas so they'll they be armed and alarmed at certain times. Uh, so that's, that's there. Uh, we're starting to look at uh, door replacements for Alvern, Memorial, and Hills Garrison in this round of our budgeting. Um, I did, as you'll see in the general repairs, we added door replacements for those three buildings. Some of the doors we found uh, that our immediate need we are, are addressing this year. So that's, we're taking that out of this year's budget. Uh, and then at the request of Rachel and Special Services, there are some accessibility upgrades we, we're looking to do at the high school for a, a specific student that's going there next fall. So, and we're also looking at a, another round of uh, window replacements at Memorial. That's a, kind of a perennial project that we do there. Uh, the proposed budget, as you see, like I said, it's, it shows down 0.452. It's actually more closely to level funded from last year. Um, my utilities analysis is the same process we've been doing for the past few years, and it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, we always seem to be within budget or at least able to pay the bills for the heat and the, and the, uh, the gas. Uh, so what we do is we take five years of actuals, and we take three of the highest years, we take that average, and then we'll add whatever increase our current vendors are, are saying they're projecting for next year. So this process is exactly the same as what we did the past four years or so. Um, and you'll see the inflation increase, uh, I believe we're, we are down slightly overall. So we're, we're almost the same as what we budgeted for this year. 
um, the budget walk, supplies and chemicals. Uh, we, we do the same thing. We'll take what we spent uh, last year, and then we'll, we'll add whatever what the actuals from last year. We'll add whatever percentage the, uh, our vendors are, are, are estimating for next year. Um, in some of those supplies, uh, when we did take the actuals this year, they're not projecting a huge increase, so that's actually good for us. <laughs> um, disposal services is, is uh, a contracted, uh, uh, we went out for bid for that this past year, so these are contracted services and, and prices that uh, for, we did a five year uh, bid with them, so that was approved by the board. Um, when we get to repairs and general repairs, that, that one's always shifting every year because of the different projects that we're adding and subtracting. Uh, so that, when we get into those line items, if you have any questions on those, we can go through those. Um, and you'll see electric uh, utilities, gas, grounds vehicle came out. And additional custodial equipment came out, so those are all down. And then the ones at the very bottom are the, the 544 and the 250. Those were the Warren articles from, from last year. Uh, page 6 is really just another overview of, of what we looked at on the other sheet. Uh, and again, page 7, similar to that. But I do want to get into those staff members. Uh, so on page 8 at the bottom, Doug... Uh, the line 36, that is actually coded to the wrong building, so we're going to change that after this meeting uh, before the next round. But on page 9, line number 37 is, is, is a duplicate for another employee we have, so that's coming out. Uh, the line 38 is the gentleman that's retiring, and that is also listed at the bottom as vacant H.O. Smith. I would prefer to take out line 38 because line... 30, oh, sorry, 59 is more accurate for an incoming new hire. And then line 44 is a duplicate again, and that line will be coming out. If that makes sense. And uh, Gary, as you stated, that vacant HAVAC is, is filled as, and we're starting on November 4th. That, re that will result in a reduction of 146582 from John's budget. 146582, Melissa? Yep. Correct. Thank you. And the board also has that detail of those staffing changes that Mr. Pratt just called out of those specific account lines. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to, if you have any questions, I guess, on... A lot of these line items are very similar to what we do year to year for supplies, chemicals. Uh, I mentioned supplies earlier. Uh, telephone. So on the telephone, I know it's a small amount, but is there a reason it's going up? Is it more, Which one? Is it more users? The telephone. The telephone it used to be uh, like six or seven thousand. Now it's approaching twelve. Or maybe yep. So we had we added uh, one one more coming in. Uh, and I think Maureen brought this up last year. There was, we, she wanted to know how many we had, and so we tried to clarify that. So we have certain employees, we, we did add one line, uh, that choose to have our Verizon account phones, and we have some employees that choose to keep their own phones, and then we give them the stipend. So I tried to separate that this year, yeah. okay. that there's seven stipends, and then there's, I think I said seven, and then I think seven uh, Verizon accounts that we have. But the cost of the plan is going up. Is that what's driving the price? What's that? Is it the cost of the plan going Surprisingly, up? Surprisingly, the cost of our plans hasn't gone up, which... Right, well, that... And, and what's that what went through my head, is, and that's why yeah. I was just wondering. So we've added users, so... Yeah, and I did dive in... After last year, I did dive into it deeper, and I think there were some on there that weren't accounted for, but I know we did add one line to this. Um, so really, uh, the general repairs lines are the ones that we usually kind of get into the weeds with. Um, and these projects that I listed here, uh, after talking with Dan uh, and the building principals, these are all uh, things that were brought up that wanted to be looked into for uh, the budget process. 
Uh, so if you look at uh, 10, 11, 26, 20, that's, that's uh, H.O. Smith. Um, not a whole lot of big things going on there outside of the normal general repairs, uh, but we're finishing another set of bathroom floors. We did one set this year. We want to finish the other ones uh, next year. And then on every school, you'll see the additional uh, alert beacons on a, as a line item. Page 18, uh, Library Street Schools at the top, the blue beacons. For our building on 13, um, and I apologize, I thought I had all the roofs done, and I kind of missed the small flat roof on our, our building, so that I added that in to, um, to finalize that one. And after talking with Dan when we went through this, I mean, some of these uh, bigger items are the privy to the board if they want to take that or either move it to an end of the year spending or add it as a worn article. So I know that usually at the end you say, what are you going to remove? And, and uh, so some of these things uh, you know, are at your request if you want to so move them as a worn article. Since, since you brought it up, yeah. um, is the window replacement a contract or could that be a warrant article? So when we did the original RFP, which was eight years ago now or seven years ago now, we put in the RFP uh, to stay with the vendor that supplied the windows for consistency. Um, Portland Glass is the vendor now, and the windows they supply have lifetime warranties for springs and balances. Um, but that's a great question because I brought that up. And, and I know for Memor uh, Memorial, that price is this high this year because it's a, it's a high number and it's a high number only because um, it, it's actually the front is right. the front entrance it's got it's the whole facade that they're actually going to change the exterior doors which is the big part of the price and those doors all have electric strikes in them and uh, so that's kind of what's driving that one there yeah that might just be some me personally I would like to see that probably as a warrant article if, if possible and then the other one is the alert beacons um, if we add them all up, they're about 60000 Someone there. And then Somewhere. Alvern is the highest because we're adding more security mm -hmm. features there. Yeah. So that, that one there, I feel like I, I'm torn between either a warrant article or if that's truly a safety issue, is that something that we use our year-end spending for? As opposed to Again, that's entirely budget. up to the board. So that's just something, yeah. not for tonight, but yeah. I just putting it out there, something that's going through my head. And I know on, on past years we've been adding warrant, warrant articles that are uh, basically going to come out of end of year spending. Right. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I don't know if there's any other big projects there you want to discuss. Uh, it, you'll see at Alvern, uh, we were referring to accessible openers for the gym and for the library and adding a uh, stage, a lift, an accessible lift for the stage for, a particular, for one particular student or not just for one, but in the future we'd have a lift to get up there. I did, <clears throat> I did add at Memorial, uh, last year the board had asked to do the uh, flooring throughout all the hallways. Uh, one thing we, I won't say overlooked, but we, we didn't do the cafeteria and the small cafeteria there that actually are the same level. And we thought it would actually be better uh, custodial-wise even as far as finishing and waxing that if we finished those areas, we wouldn't have to do any finishing on, the whole, on any of the hallway floors or cafeteria floors. John, could you also mention the HMS fire panel that I called out yep. in the executive summary a little bit too? <clears throat> yep, so HMS, the, the fire panel, um, we switched our, vend our security vendor and our fire vendor this past year. Uh, we're getting much better results and much better response. Uh, we've been having a few issues over the past year with the, with the memorial panel and come to find out that panel is, is I won't say obsolete, they can still get parts. But we've, it's been giving us fits with the enunciator on the other side of the building. So uh, after discussing it with them, it's, it's really time to, uh, to look at replacing that panel. Um, I actually went to a seminar today uh, put on by this company, and they were going over the new panels and how they can actually self-test themselves. So we wouldn't have to bring a vendor in every year, and they wouldn't have to go through every classroom and every, every detector. And, uh, so it's more state-of-the-art kind of thing. Thank you, John. Yeah. One other question. Sure. Do we know how much is in our roof um, capital reserve fund? Let us check that. Again, it doesn't need to be tonight, just something as we think about funding the. Yep. I don't remember. I know we used it for the roof. We used some of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't know what we had left. I was in there today. 
John, could you speak further to the Nottingham West sidewalk um, mm -hmm. issues that Dan mentioned a little bit? And I see that line item in here. Mm -hmm. So uh, we at Nottingham West, if, uh, if you're looking at the building on the sidewalk that comes down the side by the playground, we had a couple of there are about 14 15 foot slabs there that kind of he either heaved yep. so it was raised up maybe three quarters of an inch so it was kind of a tripping hazard we, we had a couple of uh, people trip and fall over the past year uh, Dan had approached me about it we started looking at you know what the cost would be to actually you know excavate out that whole <laughs> sidewalk and the cost would be astronomical um, I ended up finding a company that uh, does a kind of a unique process they actually drill into the concrete that's there and they inject it with a foam and the foam actually lifts it back up and levels it off so we uh, we hired them to do that uh, they came out last week and did that so there was three distinct sections there that uh, that were trip hazards um, they came out in probably a day and the only issue they found or had was instead of being a conventional three or four inch concrete sidewalk it was actually like 12 inches <laughs> so they had the darndest time getting it to, you know, they, they got it very, very close, and then they just ground and tapered off the rest of it. So my thought was, rather than paying you know over one hundred fifty thousand dollars or whatever it was to take out that whole sidewalk, the front sidewalk still has a lot of cracks. And I thought if we could saw cut out and reform that piece only next summer, then we, we'd have a, a decent sidewalk there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the the sidewalk repair is less about the, the trip hazards are fixed at this point? Well, the front, uh, our grounds crew has been repairing it as much as they can, but with the winters, it, once it gets to a certain point and with the, with the freezing and thawing, it just keeps happening because it's just a patch. So it, it, it will turn into a trip hazard, I mean, if, it's, if it isn't much of one already, but they do avoid it, you know. Uh, but I know we've been out there trying to fill it and fill it and fill it, but it's, it's just not going to... It's a lot of labor and a lot of effort to, rather than just reforming it. Any other questions or comments, Ethan? John, where are you on vehicles right now? No new vehicles in this budget? No new vehicles. Uh, we'd probably be looking at the plumber's vehicle uh, for the next round of budgeting for the following year. The, the new mower, John, is that the big field mower or is that the smaller ones? That's a, it's a bigger mower, but it's got a bagger system on it um, that uh, our current heads groundskeeper would prefer for the football field. Um, one of the mowers, I want to say it's on its last legs, but they're getting by with it. And I, I, I can't remember which one I meant to talk to Alan the day before I got here, but I, I was out of the office. Um, and of course, our goal is hopefully that we could take on more of the, uh, the landscaping with the uh, grounds level two that does our maintenance. Um, I don't know that we'll ever get away from uh, the Morins or the, the work they're doing, especially when it comes to fertilizing, because we're using them to fertilize. Um, there's a lot of logistics for fertilizing, and, and uh, Alan and our crew uh, do not have the certification. We found out that even if he was certified, with what we're paying for Morin and what we'd actually buy the product for, it's it's almost exactly the same so I'd rather put the onus on them to put their proper signs out and and, and have them do that and, and then you know the leaf pick up and all that stuff but, but we're, we want to transition we want to give it some time so everybody gets accustomed to see what we can do you know next year and I think uh, as far as the mowing of the general campus areas for every school I, I don't think that's going to be an issue for us and that was one of the driving forces for the mowers that, that he was requesting Remind me where we are in the plowing landscaping contracts. We are, I believe, in our third year. That sounds right. Third year of both? Third year of, of plowing. In a, we're in our second year, I believe, and uh, I'll have to look again. Of how many year contracts? Five. So it's three years with two, two option years. Two options. Yeah. With the... I just have a quick clarification. You mentioned in the with the window replacements mm -hmm. uh, in the middle school that it will do some doors. Is that the doors later on in the thing, or is that those? No, are that's separate? all inclusive. Doors okay, and sorry windows. about that. Yeah, no, that's fine. With the second HVAC person now, are we seeing any reductions in like the, the outside 
contracted PM stuff? No, because he doesn't start until November 4th. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's one of my goals, is, is to reduce that contract. Okay. Uh, um, it, been talking with our current HVAC tech that we would bring this person in. Right now his focus is going to be what can we do to get rid of, not get rid of, or get ahead of that so we have someone actually on staff to do uh, more quarterly changes and get that rolling. Um, I, I believe that's worth worth the money right there, and I think we can get there. But he's going to have to get acclimated, and, and uh, we have time. We have uh, all this winter he'll be here. Uh, if we have to adjust those numbers uh, for the preventive maintenance program, um, I believe we'll be able to do that. You know, after the vote, after everything's settled, I think we're going to have a very good idea of what these two can do together. Can you, can you point to those line items for me? Yep, they're in uh, those are. repair and maintenance contracts. Those are starting on page 24. Those are all our repair and maintenance contracts. Uh, and you'll see the HVAC PM asset program lines for each school. <clears throat> I apologize, I didn't add them all together, but they're, they're all in individual buildings. The biggest chunk is always going to be Alvern, uh, specifically the CTE with the amount of equipment that was installed. Is maintenance for heat controls included in that? That's for uh, digital controls, upgrades. Uh, if any uh, actuators or modules go down, we, we annually budget for that. I did drop those a little bit now that we're transferring, uh, transferring over to train. What is the total cost, and I apologize if it was said earlier, for the additional alert beacons? I see the various line items. I just wanted to make sure that I don't miss any. Do you have a total cost for that? I don't. I didn't add up each building. Like, okay. I got like 66. Okay. 66,000 and change when I took a rough number. John, another question on page 18. What are the buildings? Quite a bit of replacement of flooring. I see replace main office, flooring, replace special services office flooring, and then number 13 in there, replace the library carpet. Which building is that? Uh, those are Hills Garrison. Yeah, I met with Theo. Uh, I did walk through the... Uh, Special services area in the main office, and there's a there's a vinyl plank flooring that's all cracking. Um, they're saying people are kind of like trip trip not tripping over it, but getting their heels and stuff, and it's uh, it's at the end of its life. The library carpet we actually had, I believe, in last year, and it was taken out when the library furniture was taken out. How old do we think that vinyl plank is? <sighs> Got to be eight or nine years it wasn't a very quality good quality product when it put in because it's the newer the stuff we're putting in now is better it'll be similar to what we did at the middle school hallways which i thought came out pretty well any other questions or discussion related to the facilities budget Thank you, John. Um, I did want to come back with the roof. Um, we did request the reimbursement of 126000 from the trustees. So after the um, market value of $600,000 that's on the capital reserve, less the 126, there'd be roughly 500000 available. 500000 yeah. is, is the CT separated out here on the... No, Alvern and the CT have always Why? under general repairs. So if I'm count, sure. I guess I'm I'm counting seven HVAC PM pieces. Why would that be? Does the SAU have its own? Um, SAU has its own HVAC. Yeah. Okay, so that would be the seventh building. Yeah. Four yeah. elementary. Yeah. Two uppers, and then. 
Thank you. Yeah, no problem. We have Mr. Peterson next in the technology budget. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for the uh, FY 2006 technology budget. Uh, there's a large increase coming in from the IT side, um, roughly $530,000. Um, we'll go into this. Over the past um, five years, we've had a drastic increase in devices across the district, so we're really ramping up everything we do from a technology-wise. So the big thing is maintain a strong IT infrastructure and department. This way we can keep going forward with it. We're looking at the, the budget, FY26 budget. We're looking at uh, new replacement cycles that were added in as we do now uh, carts per classroom from grades K through five. So uh, we did add the uh, ELC. So kindergarten and first grade are gonna have a laptop cart per classroom. So this is to start that replacement cycle that was um, brought in this year. We have consolidation of software from multiple budgets, both the SAU and ESSER grants are being put into the IT budget. Uh, the ESSER grant sends edit, and then the PD uh, lines, the software for uh, tracking professional development as well as um, evaluations and PD training are moving from the PD side to the IT department. So that's the increase we'll be seeing there. Uh, I'm sorry, Kevin, that was from ESSER? Uh, some from ESSER and some from, I think it's Title IV? Two. Two. I can always mix up two and four. Wait, where was that before ESSER? Did we just not have that? Uh, I've been here since. I, so I'm not. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm yeah. just <laughs> to, like. Yeah. I guess if we were to read between the lines, did we not have a PD software before ESSER? Uh, no, it was always in the this. The PD software was in the Title II budget. Okay. PD budget. So we that's perhaps moved it out of Title II to ESSER for a period of time, and now it's come back. Possible, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, we're looking at replacing the district accounting and HR software. Uh, this is a one-time $200,000 budget to do the actual evaluation and implementation of a different software across the district. Our current software, we can find invoices all the way back to 2004. So we're looking at something we've had in the district for 20 years. Um, anytime you talk about replacing HR or accounting software, everyone runs to the hills. Um, but unfortunately, we're at the point where it's actually more painful to maintain our current system than actually go through the replacement cycle. Melissa told me she loved me in this. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, I, I bet you Melissa can wish she had back her 120 or so hours that she did manual this, uh, this budget season. Um, <laughs> looking at adding in a security software district-wide. Um, this is in lieu of a cybersecurity expert to bring into the, the district. Um, in light of what happened in uh, June of this year. And then starting a replacement cycle for our switching across the district. Uh, did a quick audit. Um, some of our older, more critical switches are actually gonna be approaching nine years old next year. Uh, these are the ones that are actually doing our main connections for each building. And we are starting to see some failure points. Uh, we've already replaced a couple of power supplies in them. So we're trying to get that into a replacement cycle just like we have the rest of the devices across the district. And then we just have our ongoing costs. This is just how we've continued on the IT department, keeping it strong and robust. Uh, we've done a lot of replacement cycles over the past couple of years to get us to where we have a reliable wireless system, as well as having devices ready for Windows 11, which is a critical phase that we need to go through before Windows 10 end of life next year. Um, and then just the, keeping the system up and going. Right, if we go over to the budget walk. One more, Dan. Thank you. There we go. Um, if you notice, a lot of my uh, changes are in very small areas. So as we look at the equipment uh, for HO Smith and Library Street, those two went up the $10,500. That's to start that replacement cycle for the laptops that are going to be put into the, each of the classrooms. Uh, we did uh, end up purchasing all those laptops to get that started through the ESSER, end of the ESSER grant this year. So this is just that ongoing cost that we're gonna start there. Uh, equipment and uh, HMS, that's a reduction because we did replace the lab there, so that was a one-time cost to get that lab up and going. And then at H uh, AHS, that was actually to get additional devices for our readiness for Windows 11 
as we move forward. Um, tech equipment, so we're looking at uh, $200,000 there for the district-wide. That's the software for the security to do a very, um, basically a managed service to protect our environment. Um, and like I said, that's in lieu of actually trying to hire in security experts to be on board. Um, reality, we would need four security experts to cover us 24 seven, because as we all know, the bad guys don't work when we work, they'll work after hours, weekends, stuff like that. So this does a 24 hour, hour coverage of our network is what we're looking to implement. The software, that's $200,000, that includes both the uh, 200000 for the munis replacement, as well as the $40,000 extra from the other grants and funds that we're looking at there. And then replacement cycles and equipment district-wide, that's for to replace two switches. We currently have 28 switches across the network. We have seven of them that are going to be nine years old next year. So that, those are the ones we're going to start pinpoint focusing and replacing out. Any questions? This is just line by line through the budget. Um, I'll offer any questions if you like. Kevin, for the board and the public, you and I talked quite a bit about uh, cybersecurity and not mm -hmm. to go into any detail, um, but the service and the maintenance of that 200,000 versus the, you had mentioned before, the cost of adding people. And we, we had a good conversation, but I think for the board and the public, just to kind of explain that a little bit more of, how the how the service the contracted service would work in, yep. in high level high level um an issue we're looking at that uh, was a wish list from last year it was like oh if you have anything what would you get and i said you know it's some type of security vendor security service inside and so looking at what the current rates around the area you're looking at roughly all in cost somewhere between 180 and 200 thousand for per individual to be actually in-house and that's also someone who's just working 40 hours um, so that's knowing that and knowing where we were from the incident we had in June. I'm like, okay, this is obviously a, a priority. We really need to focus on trying to get this sort of resolved. How can we make it work? Um, ideally, every vendor I've ever talked to, they're like, okay, for your scale, you really need four people just to cover 24-7, the amount of people you have, stuff like that. And I'm like, there's no way our, our budget could ever afford to bring in. And there's no way as a district we could ever find four security uh, experts out there um, anywhere you talk that's always a big thing even if you go into colleges they're like they can't even find professors to teach this because it's such a draw on the, the, the public side right now so that's why I'm started uh, looking at more of a software as a service a secure having a vendor come in be a, uh, so, a security center for us instead of us actually manning our own center so we'll deploy software across the district. It'll be managed by a group of people at the different vendors, and they'll actually be able to, to watch what's going on, track anything that goes awry, and then start remediating issues right away. That's the ideal solution. I'm a dummy, so you're gonna have to explain a lot of this to me like I'm five. No problem. When you hire a person, aren't you, yes, you're, they're not literally holding up a shield in protecting nope. the district, and we don't need that 24-7. You would be hiring a person to implement some type of security system. I, am I wrong about that? Uh, yes and that, no. That, so even though, yes, they're not on the clock 24-7, mm -hmm. in theory, I, I'm a dummy, mm -hmm. in theory they implement some type of system, and then when that system, when we start getting whatever, pings from Asia or Africa or wherever, then they're, all right, we're, we're coming in, we're gonna go to work now. But that's saying they're coming in, they're going to work now. So if they were already working for an eight hour day, they went home for dinner, now they're working for another 20 hours straight. Or if it's a zero day environment, where which means it's something that's never been seen before, uh, which is happening almost daily at this point with the invention of um, AI, they're actually using to actually create the malwares and stuff, they're even doing um, malware across air gap networks at this point so it, it's cutting they're really unfortunately the bad guys are on the cutting edge and so when they attack a network it's not something that you can one see right away I think the average time inside a network they're saying now is six months 
So with they get into your network, they sit in your network for six months, they do all types of basically booby traps or start siphoning off the data to sell off on the back, uh, back web. So the, the beauty of a cyber vendor is they have that vast pool of the entire world knowing here are all the signatures, here's all the things that are going on, we know what to look for instantly and do the reme remediation right then. Whereas if it's, say, say you're, you're on call, you're the security guy, you're in Alvern, say, we know there's no cell phone signal there, now they have the network for X amount of time, free roaming, doing everything they want, pulling all that information out. Whereas it's an outside vendor, they have 40 people sitting there just watching all the different networks that they manage and they just go, let's fix it, let's stop it, lock it down, start doing the guarding. Are they liable if we are attacked? Uh, they have instant responses and they, they do up to certain amounts, just like our cybersecurity vendor for um, insurance. So if there is a data leak, mm -hmm. can we sue them? I don't believe so, but that would have to be something I would look at. I've never seen that. I've seen, they, I've seen where they have, oh, I have a million dollars to help mediate or even do into the negotiations, but I don't think I've ever seen any vendor say, yeah, we're liable. You can sue us for a billion dollars. I've never seen that written in. They're typically only liable if they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. if they're that, But if someone gets through, then they get through. They can't recover. Because that's that. saying you're basically, they would have to put their neck on the line for a zero day events, and no one out there is going to do that. I have a couple of questions related to software on page 19. Yep. Um, so the cost of $200,000 to replace Munis, it's noted there that that's a, the one-time fee for migration and implementation. Yep. Do you have any general sense of what ongoing service and support would cost annually for um, some kind of Moose replacement? Has, Moose has done a great job of starting to collect a lot of that information, and the forecasts are actually lower than we're currently paying for okay. our current system. So. After that 200000 there should be, there may even be a reduction in cost. Okay. Um, but then definitely a reduction in the amount of effort we're putting into, like, the manual process we do right now. And when you say reduction, I see, speaking of that, line 28 there, mm -hmm. in addition to the one-time cost for a new system, would we be removing line 28 because of the, that's the Munis annual software maintenance? Would we? No, because you, it would be uh, 200,000 to actually start the process of figuring out where we're going. Deployment timeline. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because so you would still need to maintain we'll Munis. We'll still maintain it before we go on to the next. Uh, typical timeline, you're looking at minimum of the six months yes. from one from to up to a year okay. of actually doing something. And knowing we've had this software, like I said, for at least 20 years, mm -hmm. where it's there's a lot of cleanup, a lot of manual work we have to do to get it to where it can be then imported into a new system. Okay. But it does appear that in your research, Melissa, that the annual software maintenance fee may be less than that current $60,000 that Munis is. Yes. They're ballparking 11 to $15 per student. Okay. Um, other question, Schoology cost, Yes. $32,000. Mm -hmm. What would it cost to change to Google Classroom? Uh, it would be the cost of additional software for uh, some type of integration piece. Uh, Google Classroom itself um, does not integrate right into, say, PowerSchool, where Schoology obviously is a direct integration into PowerSchool. Um, so you'd have to get a third-party software that does that integration. I think it's called Little Sys. Um, I have not worked with it directly. I know our data administrator here has uh, when we were using Google Classroom prior to Schoology, um, and it was a constant hurdle trying to get keep the classes synced and stuff like that. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a cost to that. Um, I think that's, it's, it's low. It's, I think it's like five, maybe 6,000 a year for that service. Um, but because it's, we're going to, if we go with, say, Google Classroom, uh, we would have to increase our licenses for Google. Right now, we don't pay a licensing fee to Google. We'd have to upgrade more to an enterprise level to do better tracking and uh, restrictions on what can be done and utilize additional features in the Google um, Meet area, so the Hangouts, it's called. So you'd have, so you could do breakout rooms and stuff like that. So you have to elevate your level per student to, to utilize those features. 
So that it's not just a, like, oh, we're, we'll drop 32,000 and we're good to go. It's, there's gonna be additional costs and upfit to get going there. Did we have that before? Uh, the- Before Schoology? The what part? The enterprise level? Uh, no, because the enterprise level stuff started just as um, COVID started because they were seeing the, the deficit they had compared to say Zoom and they had to figure out how to make it work. And so they had to uh, reinvent all that stuff. Where are, sorry, one more. Uh, where are we with Unified Insights? We had some discussion last year mm -hmm. and or follow up. I see that as a line item in here. Where, where does that stand? Uh, it's up and running. Okay. Um, and it's integrated right into PowerSchool. It's doing okay. things. Um, we are, it's a little bit of a holding pattern with some of the areas like um, not attendance, uh, like discipline logs and stuff like that, because Google, uh, Google, uh, PowerSchool is changing the way they do their discipline logs with incidents versus log entries. So that's in a, a little flux there this year as that converts again. But, but it is up and running. Hey, Melissa, can I ask you a question? Because it sounds like you've done a lot, a lot of legwork on Immunis replacement. Um, I started. You, okay. I'm, yes. Take the credit. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin's definitely giving you the credit. Um, wh what is the timeline for that, out of my curiosity? When I was with the state, we transitioned from an old, very old antiquated system mm -hmm. to a very cloud-based system, Ooh. and that was a year and a half. But that was the actual transition years. piece. What, what about the, the timeline for literally picking what we're replacing it with? I would start that. This year, I'm I'm planning on contacting three vendors, um, which I have okay. for quotes. But I'm planning on having them come in and demo their product on site with IT, purchasing, HR, and finance team there, so that we can all ask our questions. Can I ask a hypothetical without people having heart attacks? Don't have a heart attack, please. <laughs> Kevin had, I, I know you just said it took over a year from your other system. Kevin had mentioned perhaps six months earlier. If in a hypothetical world, we had a system picked by Jan 1, that gives us six months to the end of the year. If we could pay for, let's say we could pay for that system right now, 200 grand right now. In theory, that would save us the 60 grand from Munis next year, no? No. Why? Because then we'd be paying for the new software. So you'd be saving maybe 15 to 20 grand max, because you still have to pay the, it's 200 grand just for the implementation piece. That's not saying year one, year two costs, stuff like that. And a six month turnaround is, is really quick. And I that, would, that's if we had a clean system. Yes, and if, we have a lot of stuff to clean So up this on. does not include the year one cost then? Correct. Okay, so at best, you still have Munis for another year and a half? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to help. Yeah. That's what it was. I was trying to help. Thank you. So to confirm again, Kevin, just so the 200000 is the cost for deployment, testing, yep. and implementation. Implementation, migration of data, yep. stuff like that. Data, data conversion, yep. all of that. Okay. Yep. And training. Mm -hmm. One time, that's it. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go up to uh, page 10, just the staff. Uh, mm -hmm. You have two uh, vacant positions. I was just wondering how long they've been vacant. And um, these, uh, technically those positions have been vacant since about April. Um, we did bring in and still have on-prem contract uh, services. We brought them in um, mid-June and they've actually three contractors to help us through the summertime and fill up those two position staffs right now. Um, so they are working out really well. We're looking at actually potentially uh, converting two over to the, these two open positions, filling those sites. Okay. But I didn't, uh, because they're contract, I couldn't say they're filled. In okay. Quick yeah. question. Can you just help me reconcile the all devices number? Because if we think about one to one, you're at like, you know, 2,700 kids, yep. right? Then you have another seven, 800 staff. Yep. What are the other couple thousand? You're also talking um, access point switches, um, basically what keeps our network running. Gotcha. So, so this isn't this isn't this isn't computers. this isn't this just, is just is personal computing. This is, this is what it takes everything. to maintain the network. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Ethan. 
tough question. I need you to be 100% honest, and if the answer is not for a couple years, that's okay. At what point does the IT budget start to plateau? Um, you will never see a plateau. I'm, I should to be 25 percent a year is crazy. 25 percent is not going to be uh, what you see. On 15 percent mm -hmm. is still a lot. Yep. Honestly, you're going to see anywhere between seven to 12 every year. Um, the only re the only reason I was able to actually keep our one to one devices leveled for cost wise is because I had to go out to a completely different vendor on a like completely out on a branch here to get a lower price, and they enticed us to bring it. The vendor I've been using for the past three years increased their price at 100 bucks per device. So that right there would have been an additional you know, $30,000 or whatever it is to bring in devices. And we obviously couldn't keep that going. So that's why we had to go with a completely different vendor. Went from Dell to, we're now using uh, Winovos for our one-to-one -one laptops for our devices. So it's the, the IT, it's the cost is just continuously increasing. There's, unfortunately, there's the cost of equipment. Ethan. What are the next cuts? Uh, for my IT budget, the only I really don't have much that's not mission critical, um, other than software that's requested from the individual buildings and stuff. So everything, all of the software I put into my budget is sort of like a multiplier. It's something that makes uh, you know we automate as much as we can and multiply you know our you know we have one uh, network admin who's managing 50 servers. Um, in a normal environment, that's one person would only manage eight servers. So everything we do is automating and stuff like that. So every software we bring in is for that automation process. So anything that I cut would be something that the individual buildings have requested of us. Can I ask a hypothetical question? Yeah. Is that part of the problem? Are we, don't shoot me taxpayers, yeah. are we not spending enough? Because as I look at private sector technology, if you try to do it with too small of a staff, it sometimes costs you a lot more money in the long run because you don't have the capacity to do the things and then something blows up and then it suddenly costs a ton of money and you need to have these contracted services which aren't cheap or you have to do this. Like, is that contributing to our problem? Is that we don't have the proper infrastructure for 2024 to run what is essentially a thousand person organization? Um, I think over the past four years I've built us to a level where we're handling it better. Um, when I first started there was only two techs controlling you know a couple thousand devices. Now we have the techs across all the buildings and stuff like that because we're, we're really running in an enterprise network with 4,000 daily users. That's how we have to look at because it. it's not just the staff. Right, right. Every kid has a one-to-one -one device. Everyone has, you know, um, everyone from middle school up has a BYOD device in their pocket or they're bringing a laptop or something like that. So we're, we're maintaining and managing this enterprise network. Um, that's where we have to basically do the multipliers of doing automation and stuff like that. Because, like I said, there's, uh, if, if this was an enterprise environment um, company, we would have a security department and they would be here 24-7 watching everything going on. That's not something we can really absorb here as a school district because obviously our primary goal is teaching kids and keeping the environment safe. But even beyond the security, mm -hmm. if you have one person with 50 servers versus yeah. the industry standard of eight or nine, yeah. something is, something Some, is going something, to Something break. can break, yeah. And that's, that's why we're looking at you know, how can we um, put as many safeguards in place, how many different softwares can we put in place to, to keep this going. Yeah. Um, we have leveraged um, Microsoft quite a bit over the past couple of years to replace some of our legacy uh, uh, policies and procedures to do more cloud-based stuff, do more of that automation side. Because part of those pieces is what it gave us the initial trigger to see what was happening in June and then react as quickly as we could. In talking about mission critical, mm -hmm. 200 grand for security, mm -hmm. if, isn't if it's critical you would need it now? Uh, we do need it now. I, every morning I wake up about 2 in the morning, look to see if I got a crypto locker email. Every day we probably, between my network admin and myself, we probably spend about two hours a day 
going through false leads or going through, oh, this person's account was compromised, going through resetting and clearing them out and kicking them off and getting them signed back in. So we're, we're diverting a lot of effort and a lot of time every day to the security side, which we need to do because obviously this is something we weren't talking about a year ago. Yeah. So th this is a mission critical software. I ask a dumb question then. Go right ahead. So why not ask for it right now? I, if I th thought we could get away with it, I would. Go ahead. Do you have any idea where we fall in compared to our comparison school districts in terms of tech budget? Uh, not according to tech budget, no. Okay. I, I, I pretty much over the past um, six months, my focus has been getting the network going, getting the school started on time, stuff like that. I haven't been really concerned about other areas. Dan, could we pull mm -hmm. comparison tech yep. budgets? I'm yep. just curious, yep. to, to all, even to Gary's points, too. Yep. I mean, we don't have to go crazy on those, of course. Yep. Londonderry, maybe Salem, Aramac, maybe Pelham, those handful of ones that we do. Sorry, that's a pain, I know. No. One more question, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Can you remind me Power School communication system? Yes. What specifically is that? That is the new um, school messenger. It's basically what does the communication for um, snow days and um, all the alerts that the, the uh, principals can send out to the parents of the students and stuff like that. So it's not going through Power School. It is. It is. There's a module in Power School that actually does the, the call outs, the robocalls, the uh, email blasts, stuff like that. So it's, uh, I think it was School Messenger last, oh no, it was Swift K-12 last year. Uh, they literally just stopped service on us. They said, we're closing our doors um, July 1. So we had to do a quick switch over. Mm -hmm. um, other schools I know have used Blackboard. Um, so there's a bunch of different uh, services like that. I'm familiar with School Messenger, other districts I've been in. So it, as, as Kevin mentioned, it, it just it takes the information right from PowerSchool, and you can send out and push out a message. Okay. Yep. It's all the contact information. So the communication is not within PowerSchool. PowerSchool is the tool. Yes. That is being utilized to send messages yes. in a variety of other methods. Correct. Okay. Through through Thank email, um, text, text, text message, message. Okay. voicemail, phone, phone calls, stuff like that. Okay. Kevin, wish list pieces? Uh, wish list is my 200,000 for my. That's not included in this already? Um, realistically, if I could get more money for replacing switches, that would make me feel better. Um, I think I counted nine switches that are at that next year will be nine years old. Um, and the majority of them are what we call the gateway switches for the building. So that's the main communication for that building. Um, so those are to me a, a critical piece. How, how many are in your budget right now? Two. Two. What's the cost? Uh, they range anywhere from thirty to sixty thousand uh, dollars. Our hope is because we've reduced the number of um, wired computer labs across the district that we could actually reduce the capacity needs in those areas so we could keep those prices lower. How long does it take to replace one of those? Uh, to replace a switch? Mm -hmm. um, usually it, we, we do it within a day. Um, it's usually pretty quick. We get the old configuration, modify a new configuration for the new switch, and then just the hardest part is actually literally putting it in the rack and then moving the wires again. How, um, how available are those? Uh, the last one, it took us about two months to get in, so it's, it's and, pretty regular. But they're all different? Um, different as in they have different sizes, so you're looking at uh, one that could be only like an 8 or 12 port switch and then some that can be up to like... Uh, but you, the, the two included in your budget would effectively be preventative replacement? Yeah, this would start that preventative replacement cycle across the district. What, I guess I, I'm just thinking out loud, what, what, would, what would harm us from, you know, either purchasing and just literally waiting until one died? The, the, the downside is if we don't have, um, because they're highly configurable, if we don't have that fully backed up patch and ready to go, then the new one will take a little bit longer to get back up in. Um, the other thing is it does cut all communication to a building, including phones, so it becomes a safety issue. Um, 
while we're doing that swap over process. Typically, we do the swap overs like uh, either uh, like a PD day or something like that, or during the summer stuff. We, we but we so again understanding nine years is old. Yep. Yeah. We don't actually have an idea on when those start to die. Uh, technically, the um, the models that they are are would consider end of life, but the, we can still get some of the parts for them. So we're having to go to that next version of a, a switch setup. Um, so it, when they die, they die hard. There's there's no way around it. Um, we we're lucky that they have uh, redundant power supplies and cards and stuff like that that we could swap in and out, and that's what we're finding ourselves doing more often than we prefer. Um, we just had to replace one of the, the power supplies for one at Alvern just this past week. Any further discussion or questions? Kevin, thank you for coming tonight. Thanks for staying. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Kevin. So with, Sorry. with the budget portion of uh, the meeting of new business complete, we will now move on to policies. Yes. So we have a number of policies included this evening for second reading. We saw the first reading a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there were a couple of edits that um, were mentioned at the last meeting. Um, one of which that I want to call out is, um, I believe it's policy KFA. And page two of that policy, um, based upon board conversation, um, page two, number 10, um, that now reads, without prior consent from a building administrator. The uh, first reading said, without prior written consent, and it said administrator, so there's a little bit more specificity, and um, but with the removal of written consent, because that consent could happen as a, as a verbal conversation with the building level administrator. Um, there was another edit and another revision to the other policy that was updated as well. Um, so but they're, they're ready to move forward for a second read. Anyone have any comments or questions regarding the policies? Make a motion to approve the policies in today's agenda. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Mike. Uh, I make a motion to add uh, extracurricular nomination to the agenda. Second. So we have a hand carry this evening for the Coral Advisor at Nottingham West. Yes. That's being brought forward. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, for Mr. Baker. Um, so Coral Advisor Kristen Mooring, um, in for for that stipend of two thousand dollars. So that we have to vote to add it to the agenda first, Mooring. Sorry. All those in favor of the motion to amend the agenda say aye. 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 We'll make a motion to approve the request. Second. Second. Any further discussion regarding the nomination? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, do we have any committee reports this evening? Uh, we do not have Board of Selectmen this evening, so moving on to Board Member Comments. Gary. Just thank um, everyone that's participated so far in the budget process. I think we're up to a great start, and just to echo how the superintendent started, Melissa, thank you very much stepping into a, a difficult process to be in a difficult situation. And to uh, Jen Burke, wherever you are, we know you're watching. Thank you for still helping us out. Ethan. None for me tonight. Mike. Um, on Friday, Erickson did a lot of construction uh, for volunteering. Last year, they volunteered at the Hills House. Uh, we saw a video on HCTV. HCTV was at the chapel, the Alvern Chapel. Uh, recording it so there's a brief synopsis of what happened with principal Beals I want to thank them so very much the Alvern trustees thank them a lot um, they're a great part of our community and again for uh, another year that they spent their whole day that they, they did a lot of work I did a, a walk through on Thursday to see what some of the stuff they were going to accomplish was in it blew my mind how much uh, they're willing to give to the community, and I hope everyone checks out that video. When it, I don't think the full video is up on HCTV yet, but the little preview with Principal Beals is. Okay. 
Thank you. I thank them for that. Thank you very much. Um, and I too will echo uh, much, as what, much of what has been said. Thank you to all involved in the budget process thus far, new principals, um, building level administrators working together, and department heads. Melissa, thank you for stepping in. Um, to Jen for continuing to help support the district in many ways. Um, so thanking all involved at the SAU as well. Um, I think that we're off to a great start and a couple of good meetings to come in the next few weeks as well. With that, I do not believe we have a non-public session this evening. There is no non-public Make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Second. Aye. Aye. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Okay. Thank you. Perfect.